So uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to our second talk in the Nightlight Spring Speaker Series uh, for 2021. Uh, today, we are um, happy to have Martin Hermes, and I'll introduce him in just a second. Uh, but I guess I should introduce myself first in case you don't know me yet. I'm Delia. I'm a Chuda's assistant. And uh, I will be standing in for him today because he is in the process of moving. So um, a little bit about the speaker series. Uh, the speaker series at Nightlight, Nightlight hosts 12 uh, talks on the year. These talks are absolutely free to the public and uh, they are made possible by the success of everybody who contributes to the Kickstarter. And thanks to all of you, as I mentioned, the talks are, are um, we're able to make the talks free and also to give our um, speakers a generous speaker's fee. So thank you everybody uh, for your continued support through there. And the purpose of the speaker series is to make um, quality astrological education accessible to all sorts of people. You know, astrology like conferences are, um, can be expensive or prohibitive. And right now they're having to be even <laughs> in COVID times, uh, there haven't even been uh, any live ones. And so that's one purpose. And the second purpose of the speaker series is to expose Achuta students to other astrological voices and topics that are not necessarily covered in his first year program. So uh, I would like to show you the lineup for um, the rest of the speaker series. Just one second, please. Uh, okay, so um, I am on the Nightlight Astrology page, nightlightastrology.com, if you go to events and speaker series. Last week, we had uh, a fantastic talk from Michelle Corbezier um, on planets returning to visibility um, related to uh, heliacal rising. The replay will still be up until tomorrow. If you missed that, please, uh, I highly encourage you to watch it because it was really great. And uh, if you would like to find out more about um, Michelle's work, book a reading with her, et cetera, uh, her website is right here, michellesmidheaven.com. Um, today, we are happy to have uh, Martin Hermes, who's going to be giving a talk on images, houses, and places. And tomorrow, uh, we're going to have uh, Kat Rose Nelligan on, who's going to be giving a talk on discovering the personal diamond. So if you have not registered yet for a uh, cat's talk tomorrow, you can do here on this page. And the replay of this talk will be available starting tomorrow on this page. Instead of register here, you will see a replay link. And if you are an active student right now in one of Achuta's courses, you will receive the recording in your uh, Dropbox. So, um, Today, okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, Martin Hermes. Her, is it Hermes or her or May or how do you pronounce uh, your last name? Well, in Dutch, it's Hermes, uh, but I think Hermes is uh, pretty good in in English. Yeah. Okay, Hermes. Hermes. So I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so Martin uh, came on last year and he gave an absolutely wonderful talk on the lots. Uh, that was very well received, and so we are so excited to have him back, and today he's going to be giving um, a talk on the house. He's going to be explaining the houses, the places, how you can understand them in relationship to each other. Um, Martin, um, here's a, a little biography about him. Mm -hmm. um, I am just going to read it. So in 1983, I came into contact with the world of alternative medicine and astrology. I'm a qualified Dutch astrologer, quite happy with my family name, Her Hermes, uh, which is not an alias. It is actually his real last name. Uh, Martin has been teaching astrology since 1985. And since 1986, he's been intensively involved with Freudian and Jungian psychology and counseling and its application in astrological practice. 
Since 1994, he's been researching traditional astrological sources and regularly lectures and does workshops on the insights from this field of knowledge. He studied Robert Zoller's course on medieval astrology and has studied a while with Stephen Birchfield. Since 2003, he, start, uh, he started studying the work of Robert Schmidt, the man who restored Hellenistic astrology and put it on the map. His astrology was never the same after that. From 1998 to 2004, he was chief editor and publisher of Anima Astrologiae. I'm sorry, I apologize for my pronunciation, a magazine for the promotion of traditional astrological expertise in the Dutch language area. And in May of 2010, he started the project uh, that he calls the reintroduction of fate and destiny into the astrologer's expertise. The first seminar devoted to it, Elements of Destiny in the Natives Charts, dealt with the positioning of astrology as a discipline within the concepts of destiny and conversely, the positioning of the concepts of destiny within astrology. Fascinating. That eventually became the content of the 2015 uh, book, Moving and Being Moved, The Return of Fate in Astrology about which a colleague, a colleague wrote earlier, I already wrote that I think this is one of the most important astrological books which have been published in the Netherlands and I still support this claim. That book has uh, since been translated into French. Martin does consultations, courses, lectures, and workshops on classical astrology in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. He taught the module Astrology as a Platonic Hermetic Jungian Practicum at the Academy of Humanities in Utrecht, for some years. Uh, so that is uh, some notes about our speakers. And um, just a little bit of uh, talk etiquette before uh, I hand it over to him. Um, I will be turning off the chat box in order for it not to um, distract from the talk because we've had some feedback that the Zoom chat box can be distracting. You will mm. still be able to send Oh, I guess it's that's how it is right now. You'll be able to send uh, chats to um, me personally in case you encounter any sort of technical problems. I'll be happy to help. And if you have any questions about the talk, there will be a Q&A section at the end of the talk. Please type your questions for Martine into the Q&A box uh, that is in your Zoom panel. So questions for Martine to answer about his talk in the Q&A panel. Any other technical questions you may have, you can type them into the chat box for me. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will hand it over to our featured speaker of the day, Martin. Thank, Thank you. you. There we have it, I think. Yep. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me again in this fascinating talk about images, houses and places. Um, I think it will be a challenging uh, topic for a lot of people uh, as it was for me and sometimes still is. Um, and I must say uh, beforehand that I have no actual charts in this talk. Uh, but it's not just theory. I will uh, be offering a lot of practical suggestions for uh, delineations that are, I think, new and uh, also very revealing. So I'm hoping you will enjoy it. And uh, it's all about looking in a new way at the concepts to help you understand this uh, intricate material that is so uh, very interestingly revealed by the studies uh, of Robert Schmidt. So, uh, well, let's uh, so take your time to di digest it and uh, the video will be available longer after my talk. And I think you will need it as did I when I started studying this material. So, um, well, let's delve into it. So what will I will be doing is um, I will do a very short introduction into the concept of fate, 
the reason is that I did that in the first talk uh, that I was allowed to do here. And um, I will refer you to that talk where, where I was uh, explaining something about uh, the fate concept, which is, which is very uh, promising for the study of astrology. But I will address another facet of uh, uh, fate in this talk, as well as an introduction to uh, uh, the topics of the, the places, the houses and the images. So uh, actually, the second part is about how fate distributes itself by means of the places, by means of the houses and in the images. And uh, I will specifically address the images. That was a request by Acuta. Um, and I will be talking about their essential and accidental qualities, the images and the personality traits that we get so often confronted with. And uh, the essential dignities can be very well understood by the concept of oikeosis. So these are the principles that I will be addressing uh, in this talk, and I hope you will enjoy it. And I hope uh, you will uh, use it in your practice and in your studies. It's very fascinating, as you will see. Okay, so I will start at the beginnings, the rediscovery of Greek Hellenistic astrology. Uh, this will be a very short introduction because as I said, I did that in the previous talk. So let's have a look. The most important uh, person that I will be quoting uh, uh, very much is uh, Mr. Robert Schmidt, who passed away, uh, unfortunately, in uh, December of 2018 but he wrote very important work on astrology. And I think uh, when you're not acquainted with his work that I will uh, acquaint you with it through this talk because I will be using his insights uh, as a, a guiding a line for this presentation. So, so my main sources are his work. Uh, I believe that I own most or all of his workshops and tutorials. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but um, I have studied him for a long time and it, again, it's fascinating material. So, and I hope you, I can explain it to you and I hope I can illustrate it uh, for you. So let's have a small look at what Schmidt uh, did. Uh, Schmidt's approach is uh, the analysis, uh, the anatomy of words. That was the way Akuta uh, talked about it, which is a very adequate way to explain the word uh, etymology because you're trying to analyze the words and this is what Robert Schmidt did with the Greek language which is the uh, one of the uh, very ancient uh, ways and uh, writings of astrologers about our uh, topic uh, astrology so um, that's what he did and the, uh, so you can say that he had an etymological approach he tried to use and understand the words on their own uh, basis, how the astrologer used them and how they understood these words and not as we now think about these subjects as astrologers. So, and what I find very fascinating is that the Stoics were of the opinion that etymology is the key that unlocks reality. And in my view, Schmidt really did that with uh, uh, Hellenistic astrology. Well, that's interesting. I uh, talked about this uh, in a previous workshop and you can find it here. If you uh, were not acquainted with it, uh, you can find it there. And the very, very good news is that since uh, his death, there was nothing uh, available of his material, but now there is. There is a new, uh, a new uh, website where his, uh, all his materials will be published and you can, uh, uh, how do you say, you can, uh, can um, you can get it for a fee for each month and you can uh, avail yourself of the material that is posted there. And I would advise everybody who's interested in this material um, to go there and, uh, and subscribe to it. That was the word I was searching for. Sub subscribe to it and you can have access to all the work that he has published and I guarantee it will be mind blowing. If you do not want to pay any money yet, uh, you can go to this uh, website. Um, the, they were, uh, Robert was a friend of Matthew Woods and uh, vice versa. And they had a talk, an interesting talk about uh, astrology and herbalism. And uh, you can listen to it for free. And uh, you, when you do, you will hear uh, the depth of knowledge uh, of uh, Robert Schmidt about Hellenistic astrology. So 
check it out and uh, avail yourself of the wonderful insights that Mr. Schmidt had. So that's interesting. Okay. Well, when I'm, I need to hide this panel. And look, sorry. Oh, sorry to go up. Let me get back. Um, what I'm trying to do is to build this up so that you can understand where this is all coming from. And uh, to start again with uh, the idea of fate. Fate terminology is very rampant in uh, the ancient astrology texts, uh, even later, but also very much in the uh, Greek texts about astrology. And these are very loaded words also in, uh, in philosophy. So for instance, the word pronoia is a very interesting one, which has to do with foresight, which is also providence, which is uh, also in, in the uh, Catholic religion, a very strong word. When you think of Helios, uh, the, the sun, the Helios is set down as the ruler of light, which are of two kinds. You can have Lux, which is sort of a supernal light, is mysterious light. It is of a different order. And you have Lumens, which is visible light. So there's a difference between that, but it's very interesting. For Saturn, we have the, the loaded words of Agnoia, ignorance, and Ananke, necessity, which are also fate words. And uh, well, this is quite interesting because these words appear countless times in all the ancient texts about the issue, the, the essence of certain planets. So that's very interesting. And I will be getting back to some of them in the, the, uh, the talk that will f that's following now. Okay, we also see a fate terminology in the use of the ancient words and titles of certain places in the chart. The, uh, the, what we now call the houses, which I will be coming back to again, because that's not a really good term for what we try to say with houses. Actually, they are places and the domiciles are the, 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 sign, the images where planets have their domicile. So that's something about the terminology is not quite adequate, but okay. Here we have, for instance, the 11th place is Agatha's Daimon. And Daimon is of course, again, a sort of a fate word and also a, a sort of psychological uh, word for something in you, a, a spirit or something of that kind in yourself. But uh, here the 11th place is called the Akatos Daimon, the good spirits, which says something about this place. And when the, you have planets there, they have something to do with a, a good spirit. And you have a Kakos Daimon, the evil spirit. When you look at the fifth place, you see Agate Tuche, and Tuche is the, uh, the uh, Greek word for what we call fortune. And that's a very loaded word also because it has a lot to do with uh, the distribution uh, of fated issues in somebody's life. Okay, so let's have a look at what all this stuff is about. Why all this fate stuff in this ancient astrology? Well, that had something to do with uh, what you could call the philosopher's claim. Uh, there's always the difference made in philosophy between the essential being of something, the essence, uh, which was understood as that which is unchanging and eternal, uh, think the unmoved mover of uh, Aristotle. And then there's the contingent, what we could call the accidental being, with uh, of which Thomas Aquinas had a very interesting uh, definition which is very adequate because it says it's the accidental things that go along with something without belonging to its essence, which therefore could just as well have been something else, but makes no difference for the essence, which is a very interesting and a very good definition of what accidental means. But this contingent contingency of life was something that the uh, uh, philosophers were not very happy about because it's the world of coming to be and passing away. So let's have another look at the definition of contingent. Uh, and there you see uh, some things, uh, some words having to do with uh, conditional stuff, S something not yet certain, uncertain, something that might be possible, what is liable to happen or not. So it has to do with chance. It has to do with uh, coincidences. So that's from the dictionary. And in modern times, there's a lot of uh, confusion about 
the principle of contingency as something that goes along with something. So that's why I, I uh, uh, posted this quote, does an apple tree just grow apples or is the apple tree the creator of apples, which is a bit uh, the, the conflict that's going on about uh, when is something simply a coincidence and when is something really an essence of uh, something belonging to the essence of it. Okay, now why is this so important? Well, for the following reasons, the philosopher said that the contingent, this accidental being, is something you cannot philosophize about. Why? Simply because it's changing all the time. And when something is changing all the time, so uh, now it's there and now it's gone. That is something so fluid and so uh, difficult to get a grasp of that the philosophy schools of the day were not actually interested in this uh, contingency or this this world of coming to be and passing away. So that's very interesting. And then we have the astrologist claim which says, yes, we can. Yes, we can say something about what's coincidence in somebody's life. It doesn't belong to your essence, but it has to do with your life. It, it's contingent, it's accidental in your life, and everything that could just as well have been different. Hellenistic astrology is its model. The horoscope is its instrument. That is what the claim of Robert Schmidt. So he said, that Hellenistic astrology was simply the way this accidental being could be addressed and that it was especially designed for just that. Well, if you realize that this is the case, this is something really extraordinary because now we have an instrument that is actually capable of trying to understand that which is coming and passing away. And the astrology is of course a very interesting instrument for just that. So, and he said it was sort of a contest in his view to the Aristotelian and philosophers claim that this could not be studied. So let's have a look at that. How does that work? Now, let's first uh, state that contingency is that what we now call fate. So it's about everything that changes or what can change. And change uh, has to do with movement in astrology. And there's this famous words, uh, this famous saying about Her uh, of Heraclitus, everything flows and moves and nothing stays. Pantagorai kai uden menai. Pretty uh, verse as well. So if you look at a chart, what do you see? You see by movement that a planet is in a certain image or sign of the zodiac, mm -hmm. but that just could just as easily have been somewhere else. Uh, remember, fate is about changing movement. An image or a sign becomes a certain house, place, due to the movement of the zodiac, which determines where the sign ends up in relation to the ascendant in the whole sign house system. But, again, that could just as easily been in some other place. It's about movement, right? What changes movement? It is movement that causes an, asp an aspect or a configuration between two planets to apply or separate again. But this could just have been from some other place in the chart because that's what we uh, uh, picture when we uh, calculate a chart. That's what you see. You see, you fix uh, a certain moment in time, but the planets keep on moving and the, the chart starts, uh, moves and everything changes all the time. It's just this fixation of a, 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 a chart at birth time, which is, makes it possible for us to see what was happening at that moment. But we know that it changes all the time because we have all sorts of uh, instruments that track time, right? So, but this is a very interesting uh, uh, development and something that is very interesting about astrology as a science and as an art. Okay, so here, uh, this is a, a slide I showed in the previous pre presentation, the previous webinar. Uh, so we have man in theory, this is the essential man. You could say that this is uh, what the philosophers found very interesting. What are the essential things of being human? And the astrologer's claim is actually that the individual human being is shaped by his or her life, by events and by fated things. So. That's the reason why this astrology most probably was developed and uh, evolved in the way that it did, simply to address this issue. Let's 
have an instrument that can track change the the uh, principles of coming to be and passing away which is actually what astrology is doing right so, so let's say again what is fate astrologically you can say that the chart then is sort of a wheel of fortune or sometimes uh, a wheel of russian roulette in a certain way um so what is fate fate has to do with an apportionment it's your portion in life and that portion is always about offering and withholding so you're getting stuff and you're missing out on stuff and so in that sense it's about our talents and our challenges and you could also say about our successes and our failures but what's most important it's given for keeps it's your fate it's your chart where we can see this so so again it's about opportunities options promises and possibilities potentiality is a very famous word for that but you could also say that it also has to do with restrictions and limitations you could say an unfreedom yeah and you're not always free to act in the way you would like to or you not ha always have the freedom that you would want etc it's the challenges of your life so in a sense you could say that there might be risks ahead the russian roulette or something uh, uh, promising or something very fortunate and of course we have uh, uh, principles and in this case planets that by nature are good doers so there you have the sun the moon jupiter venus and mercury uh, under certain conditions mercury and agatopoios a good doer which means that in a sense they promise good things all things being equal and by nature you have also kakopoios planets an evil doer uh, saturn mars and sometimes the sun when a planet is too close to it and sometimes mercury and we have the sixth the eighth and the twelfth place which have to do with challenges right so this is fate uh, not all cups in your life are filled to the brim uh, some things are, work very well in your life and sometimes and some things don't and that's all different for each of us so that is fated right okay and then of course you have the three outer planets which i will not use which are very interestingly called the good, the bad, and the ugly. But some people uh, will challenge that, and perhaps they're right, I'm not sure. Okay. So let's have some practical advice. And it's very simple. You can have a survey in, in or about which areas of your life do you feel blessed, fortunate, or happy. And mostly it will be uh, the places where you are, where you feel supported, you you have been supported by people you experienced luck or benevolence and things that simply make you happy in a general sense you can point these out right in your life but there are also areas in your life where you feel not or even less blessed less fortunate or not happy at all and these areas there you experience problems and trouble and opposition and challenges etc so and the simple answer to that is look at these planets and you can see and simply uh, make a survey of where this is going on in your life and then we come to a very important magical sentence in our astrology which is that is all things being equal simply because the things that these planets promise are also very much changed by what accidental so uh, circumstances so in general by nature these planets are good doers or bad doers evil doers but uh, there are accidental conditions that change this so there you have the essence of what fate is and what uh, essential qualities are as opposed to accidental parts uh, so that's a very interesting concept to keep in mind but try to do this survey you can do this for yourself or clients for lo your loved ones and you can probably see where this is going on in the life so that's the first practical use of this uh, principle okay so again let me repeat again because i'm trying to build up uh, the the um conceptualization of what i'm going to uh, talk about uh, further on 
Again, it's about opportunities, promises and restrictions and unfreedom and challenges. And you can also say that again, astrology contingency is what is what fate is and it's about what changes or what can change etc and it's all by movement so moving and being moved and as Delia so kindly said this was the title of my book that I uh, wrote in Dutch uh, on moving and being moved that's as in essence the essence of our life we are moving we do things and we are being moved simply because we are not always free to do what we like so you're on a, when you have a job you have to do uh, things in a certain way and your freedom is restricted so that's a very simple example but this happens in our life all the time we are moving and we are being moved and the interesting thing is that the word i must anankastos or anankayas means to force to compel and that's the root of the word ananke and ananke is one of these loaded fate words which has to do with something that is forced upon you where you are not free to do as you would like you have to do it in a certain way or you're forced to do it and that has to do with an interesting word which is also used for a splint and the splint is used to set and fix a broken limb and that's very interesting it's about forcible constraint and that's also one of these fate issues which are sometimes very hard to deal with and um, that's uh, uh, of course one of the uh, interesting things about this astrology that they um, had no reservations of, of uh, uh, getting to grips with this part of fate so it's not all about something what you're free to choose to your liking but sometimes you're not free at all to choose so that's very interesting but uh, this word is very uh, interesting to know that uh, uh, the word ananke also has to do with a splint and that's sometimes you can feel I'm, I'm not sure if this is a verb you can feel splinted in your life simply you're not able to move in a way that you would like to which is of course a very interesting fate thing okay now from this moving and being moved i will move on to the conceptualization of the places which we know nowadays as the houses and there's a big difference between what i think is a place and a house it's perhaps a a bit uh, uh, arbitrary but these are houses and these are places and there's a difference between them and even if you don't like this difference try to understand that the, the concepts behind them uh, show a uh, point us in a certain direction and places is an interesting word simply because we need to differentiate it from what we now use as the word for for uh, a domicile which is uh, no, I'm sorry, I need to restate that. Uh, we are confusing the word house with domicile. We understand houses as being the places and we understand the domiciles as being the houses of planets, which is a big difference. So, but perhaps that's just uh, a minor difference, but I think it's interesting and very uh, important to use the right words for the right concepts. So, okay. So let's have a look at the houses, uh, sorry, the places. <laughs> as you can see, I get confused by the modern uses of all these words as well. And perhaps I will uh, uh, foul up again uh, during this talk, but I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, places, which are the houses. And the principle is moving and being moved. Now, when we look at this part of a chart, you can see that the sun and mercury are zodiacally moving towards the ascendant, but by the diurnal movement, which goes from the ascendant to the 10th place, you can say that the sun and mercury are carried away from the ascendant. Um, when you look at Venus, zodiacally, Venus is moving away from the ascendant, but by the diurnal movement, uh, Venus is carried toward the ascendant. So these are two uh, movements which counteract in a certain sense so this is about moving and being moved and that is a very important concept to understand the fate principles as i said it's a very interesting title for a book on moving and being moved so here we have uh, this uh, planet going towards a certain 
places and planets being moved away from them. And you look at the second place, I always use that as an example, and the second place is about your money. And you could say that you spend your money, you invest in things, but you get a product in return. And you could also say that your money disappears into food, but it maintains or harms your body, which is the essence of a planet in the second place. It's moving uh, away from the first place, which is you. So you can say that uh, this planet in second place is sort of an investment, but and so it's going away from you, but it's always also being returned to you by means of the diurnal motion. So these two movements are very interesting to understand as being the, uh, conceptual for the uh, symbolization of what the places actually mean. And I also use the uh, fifth place, what is coming to the fourth place, kids, which is one of the significations of the fifth place, getting children, childbirth. And the third place is what is leaving the fourth place, the house, your brothers and sisters. So here you see something coming to and something moving away or something moving away and being carried back towards something, which is a very strong conceptualization of what happens in, in these houses. So in this way, you can say that benefits by nature or malefics by nature change in, in, and their significations changes in each chart and makes it specific for each nativity. The apportionment is binding upon the individual, says the, uh, the uh, fate concept. It's binding on the individual and it's for each, uh, different for each one of us. Okay, so let's have a look at the four systems. I will do this quickly because I understood that Akuta handles this very um, uh, extensively in his uh, uh, teachings uh, of astrology, I believe in the first year, so this will be a quick one. Um, the four systems that we then find in the houses are the four angular triads, which are uh, pointed here, the first house, tenth, seventh and fourth house, which are the angles or the centers, the pivots, or the stakes, how they are lately called in uh, traditional astrology. And uh, the other signs have, uh, uh, sorry, other images, which are the houses, the places have much to do with uh, their signification, has much to do with the uh, pivot where they are focused on. So let's have a look. So here you see that these uh, focal pi pivots uh, are f actually uh, something that moves there so uh, in the first house uh the first first place you see something arriving suddenly which is uh, the ascending sign in the tenth place there is a passage the upward movement of the zodiac changes in a downward movement in the seventh place the uh for, it goes from uh, light to darkness and in the fourth place the downward movement of the zodiac turns into an upward movement so these are center something happens there okay you could all and the tenth place is in my uh, vision or uh, opinion always very uh, symbolic for what happens there and how you can conceptualize them the elf the eleventh place is pushing its contents towards the 10th place, which is the reason why these are the friends. Uh, we can also call them a professional friends or your network because they are, you, you, uh, you make use of these persons in the hope that they will push you towards your goals of the 10th place. And the ninth place has to do with something that pulls you through your work. So your, your ideals, uh, I want to do this and this is why I do this job or this is why I manifest myself like this in this world. So the ninth place has to do with uh, things that can pull you through your life. And when you do that uh, uh, out of your free will, then it's often a philosophy ninth place or it's a certain religion ninth place or when you're not very uh, um, obedient to these laws then it's the law that says how you have to do that so then it's the law that pulls you through your tenth place so that's the conceptualization um, okay now I here is a, an example of the uh, ABC system which is, in my view, a very silly system, and it has nothing to do with the contents of the uh, images nor the places. So let me ask some questions about this. Why are the 
uh, the twins and the Bowman, why are these called servile images? The other question is, why is the 12th place always associated with spirituality? Or rather, why is uh, Pisces? And everybody will say, well, yeah, that has to do with Jupiter and Venus. And, and uh, there's a lot of confusion about what happens with the 12th place in relation to uh, now uh, in this uh, uh, image uh, with the Pisces. You could also ask the question, why is the 8th place always associated with sexuality in modern astrology? Or you could also say, rather, why is Scorpio associated with sexuality now let's have a different view on that because when you look at the thema mundi which is this one you can answer these questions again and you will find a better answer in my view the reason why uh, the twins and the the bowmen are called servile is because in the thema mundi uh, gemini the twins are the 12th place and the bowman is the sixth place which are the two places that have to do with uh, servility. The 12th place is uh, associated with spirituality, but it has to do actually with Pisces. And here you see in the Thema Mundi that Pisces is the ninth image, which has to do with spirituality. And when you look at uh, the eighth place, there you find uh, um, uh, the water pour, but when you look at the fifth place, the place of uh, lovers and uh, uh, sexuality, the joy of Venus, there you find Scorpio. That's, so that's the reason why Scorpio is associated with sexuality, because in the Thema Mundi, it's the fifth place. So you see what sort of confusion you're, you're getting, because some images are now replaced or uh, imposing their signification based on the Thema Mundi, but now they are transferred to other places. So now people are saying that the 12th place has to do with spirituality. And in the ancient literature, there is no, uh, no indication that the 12th place has any anything to do with spirituality. So that's a problem, right? So let's agree that there is no 12 letter alphabet in Hellenistic astrology and it shouldn't be in modern astrology either, but okay. So these are the principles that are behind this. I will not go further into them because you can read about them here in this article, The Facets of Fate. Um, I think it's available on Acuta's website, Acuta. Uh, but I'm not quite sure, but it's it's available on the web or you can ask uh, Delia or you can ask me because we have this and we can send it to you or perhaps it's on the website of Acuta. But uh, you can read a lot about it here. So that's an interesting uh, study, really. You could also say that there is indeed sort of a seasonal ABC, uh, which makes much more sense, but not for house signification. Uh, because it follows the logic of the path of the sun. So look at this. You can see that spring is Aries, and then it, it climbs up to the what we would say as an astrologer. You see sort of the mid-heaven, which is summer, the highest place of the sun. And then we have autumn, where the sun moves away from the northern hemisphere, and the days and the nights are uh, equally long. But slowly and surely, the night time uh, is becoming longer and longer and then we go to the winter period which is in capricorn when we uh, celebrate christmas and christmas is about the return of the light right which is ha what's happened on the northern hemisphere in winter that's why we have christmas in that, in that period the return of the light right now the question is what does this have to do with house signification? Well, at first I said, no, there's no real source. But when you look at ancient charts and um, Harari astrology, you find often this, that only these four houses, these four places, uh, the first, the 10th, the 7th, and the 4th are used in uh, Cathartic astrology about out, uh, outcomes. So that's an interesting take on this. But let's leave it at that and please study that in your own time. Ah, okay, now there is again uh, some uh, uh, a survey that you can do and also a uh, sort of an instruction of how to uh, approach planets and places based on an analogy. So my approach is this. So when you think of uh, a place, a house, 
what is the best, th best thing about this? What are its gifts? What is the most positive outcomes? So try to en envision the best case scenario for each of the 12 places. And then you can ask yourself which planet in this place or, or as its ruler when the place is empty would produce or highlight or bring to prominence these uh, fantastic uh, outcomes. Which planet would produce something like that? And on the other hand, which planet in this place or as its ruler would uh, do the opposite and hinder and prevent or counteract these good uh, things? And you can ask the opposite as well. If the nature of the planet in a place is opposite to its significations, then the planet most likely refuses, withholds or denies or hinders or removes it, these things. And in the worst case, makes them a source of misery and woes. There you have the fate concept again in the sense of, yeah, sometimes you do not get what you want out of life. So in the case of a malefic, you have the worst case scenario. What is the most annoying, difficult or negative outcome of a certain place, certain house? Which planet in this place or as its ruler would highlight and emphasize or make manifest this negative side or unpleasant pleasantness? So you can do this in any chart and get uh, to a really uh, interesting uh, idea of uh, about how this is working. We have some examples because uh, Jean-Baptiste Morin, uh, better known in the English speaking world as Marinus, says the following, Venus in the seventh or as the Lord of the seventh will by its nature indicate marriage rather than lawsuits or charges coming to court. That's interesting because that's a general principle of Venus. It's a, 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 a agatopoios, a good doer. And in the seventh place, it will produce certain effects in, in, uh, in uh, accordance with its nature. And he says that Mars will indicate the opposite. Mars in the seventh will, according to his essential nature, bring about conflicts, enmities, lawsuits, and the like, because that is what he will emphasize by his nature. So that's the way uh, Mars promises something in the seventh place. So this is a really uh, a pretty easy way of, of uh, addressing a planets in a chart and what they are doing in a certain place. So, and uh, Venus will suppress uh, the difficult things that Mars might produce in uh, the seventh place, uh, of course, having to do with friendship and marriage. So, and another one, uh, of course, there's our magical sense uh, sentence again, you can not say this in a general, you can assume it, but you will have to investigate everything in the chart, because you can say this under the proviso of all things being equal when nothing else interferes. So then this will come about. But of course, we are astrologers and we need to uh, check things before we make such uh, announcements about a certain place. But you can expect it and then you can see how it is functioning in your own chart. And he also said that Jupiter in the second place by its nature will produce income, money and wealth. Saturn will prevent it and Mars will by his nature squander it. So these are things that you can pretty easily check in any chart and then you can see when it's contradicted because Saturn in the, in the second place, for instance, will not always prevent uh, people getting rich and sometimes it even uh, uh, leads to very big wealth. So, and these are the specific things that are influencing the essential nature of a planet. And that's the essence of this astrology. We need to come to grips with the idea of the accidental. And that's what the most uh, rules of uh, delineations are about. What are the exceptions? So that's interesting. But this is an interesting survey to do in any chart and do this for yourself, your family, your loved ones, etc. It's nice to, to try this and see how it works. Okay. Now, there was a very interesting song of Queen called The Thing called I Just Can't Handle It. So uh, let's have a look at uh, something that we can do with the chart and with planets in places, trying to get a grip on faded issues and there's something very interesting about that so you can do that as well and i think it will show you a very interesting way of addressing fate issues uh, for a certain specific chart so let's have a look so 
you can divide the issue of the planets in actually in two different, let's say, modes. So you can see a planet as something that is moving. Again, this is my principal idea of fate, of moving and being moved. When you are moving, you're doing things out of yourself. You're, that's, you can say it for a planet, it's self-movement, the planet as an actor, a planet doing, making, coming to action. But you can also say that a planet is being moved, which we saw in the uh, delineation of places, the houses. Planets move by themselves, but they are also being moved. And being moved, you can say that, it's a, that that is a faculty of the soul. You are experiencing something, you're feeling something. And it, that's what's called a passion, being affected by something. So this is a, a very interesting uh, way of dividing and trying to understand how planets can work. So they can work as a psychological drive, but they can also function as a faculty of the soul. And... Um, in my idea was at first to try to understand this that a planet in a place is being moved because it's moved in a certain direction by the uh, prime um, uh, movement which is the daily movement around uh, around the earth and the moving uh, part the planet be uh, acting as sort of a an, an drive uh, as uh, an actor reacting to something happening that I associated with the ruler of a place. So the, the house ruler, as we nowadays call it. And that's an interesting take on what's happening in a chart because you can use it to try to understand how things work in a, in a places, in houses. So let's have a look. You can, when we divide the planets as faculties of the soul, you can do it by trying to understand what is the essence of each planet and trying to understand it as something that is that you feel by means of the planet. Uh, I, I cannot express it in another way. So, and the interesting th uh, thing is that sense organs, and th that's how I use these planets as faculties of the soul, the, they are a way of uh, uh, um, getting an idea of what's happening in the world around you and how you respond to those things and the interesting th thing is that sense organs help us to perceive and experience a certain part of reality and in astrological uh, uh, sense that is the 12 places so and you can also say that there is an active mode of uh, perceiving and experiencing uh, reality that is by looking or scrutinizing which is a very intense way of looking at something and a passive mode is by seeing not getting it into yourself and experiencing, but not exactly the same as looking or scrutinizing. So when we look at planets in that way, then we get, and now I have to remove the zodiac because we're now talking about the planets per se in themselves. So as sense organs, you can, for instance, look at the sun and Saturn as uh, things that are, you are experiencing via the uh, issues of the sun, then you can say that that place is standing out for you. It's somehow it's catching the eye. It's something very important in your life simply because it's standing out. When you look at Saturn, the opposite of what the sun does, that is being painfully aware of something, which is also a standing out, but in a completely opposite way. So you can say that this is about shame or something. When you look at the moon and Saturn, the moon is about being touched and also concerned. So the moon is a very receptive planet. And the opposite of that, or the other side of this, or the, the more difficult side of this, is suffering and sorrow. So instead of being touched and having concern, Saturn wants to avoid things. And in this way, you can characterize all the planets in their own way by these uh, principles you can say that jupiter is about joy and hope and stimulation and mercury the opposite is simply interest and curiosity uh, mars venus mars is about being frightened or challenged or the the impulse of that you have to do something which is the opposite of venus who has desire pleasure and temptation which is the opposite of the active impulse of uh, of mars so uh yeah i got them all uh, so 
you can say that these are the uh, the planets as functioning as uh, sense organs, a way of acquainting yourself with your surroundings, which in astrology is very interesting because we have 12 of these places and we have seven traditional planets and they can all have a certain way of experiencing a certain place in the chart. That's really it. So if you uh, extend these principles, you can have this. I, I will not enumerate them. You can read them at your leisure. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say uh, Saturn, Kronos. Uh, the, one of the uh, things about Kronos is fear or experiencing pain or being ashamed of something, sort of sorrow or coldness, being painfully aware of something. That's also a very interesting one. Uh, of Saturn, especially when you're young of age, you can f feel a, a sense of shame, duty, you have to uh, come to grips with that because that's what Saturn demands. Uh, but it also has to do with persevering and enduring things. So you can see that these are all things that have to do with a sort of sensing and experiencing the world around you. And we do it via 12 places in our chart. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And again, you can do sort of a survey with this, all things being equal, of course. You can ask yourself or about a client or your friends or your loved ones, where do they find or experience joy or optimism or hope? Or what makes them happy? Are you happy or hopeful, etc.? Well, these are the places where you can find these, uh, the answer to these questions. What is a sensitive area of sadness or uncertainty? What causes it, etc.? You can see it by the 12th, 6th and 8th place, and of course, Saturn. And where do you experience annoyance or frustration or anger? What, what is it that makes you angry? Look at the 8th place and Mars, etc. So these are... Uh, again, pretty basic things that you can do with uh, planets in places. And uh, these have to do with experiencing things, which is a difference with what I'm now uh, about to present, which is this. When we are looking at planets as being actors, so the, uh, planets as having sort of a task awareness, uh, leading something, uh, devising solutions for what's happening in a certain place, then we get to another principle, which has to do modes of action. So you can say again, how does the sun do things and how does Saturn do things? And again, I uh, apply this to the rulers of the places, which is something different when a planet is in a place. So when the sun is a ruler of a certain place in your chart, then the active way in which Sun does things as a ruler of that place is that he selects and takes charge, which is catalepsis, the Greek word for what the Sun does. And Saturn tries to ignore it. So the Sun puts it into the light and Saturn wants to put it in darkness. So he ignores it. When you look at the Moon, the Moon is a very lovely planet because she gathers and includes she tries to uh, take care of things she tries to be, have foresight so she wants to try to prevent so, uh, stuff happening when it's dangerous or whatever uh, think of the principle of motherhood uh, trying to protect the little ones etc when you look at saturn he does the opposite he isolates and he excludes so you can say that each planet has a certain way of addressing issues, and uh, this is the way that the other planets do it. So uh, look at uh, Mars. What does Mars do? He cuts, he severs, and he always has to start anew, or he wants to start anew. So that's very uh, sometimes a very uh, good thing to do. Start anew, cut and sever old ties, and start again. The Venus is the opposite. She connects and unites. She does exactly the opposite of what Mars normally does. Mercury destabilizes and contests. Mercury is the, the planet of lawyers, is what they do. They destabilize and contest anything in court. And Jupiter is the judge because he stabilizes and affirms. He uh, says how it's going to end up, whatever the uh, solicitors or the lawyers say about it. Um, and well, oh yeah, destabilizing contact, etc. Yeah, I, I had them all here. So that's a way of trying to address 
what's happening with the planet in a place and how you take charge of it by means of the planet that rules a certain place. So that's an interesting way of addressing the issue of uh, how planets and uh, in places and ruler of certain places can be uh, used in a, a delineation of a chart. So when you do that, in a, I, I showed this in the previous talk as well about the uh, hermetic lots. Uh, here you see the principal ways in which each planet has a certain uh, way of addressing uh, things in life. So a certain approach. You can say that Saturn has a stoic approach, do nothing, wait it out, start over, start from scratch, training and practice, discipline and patience. That's the way Saturn does things. When you look at Jupiter, it's sometimes perhaps the pompous philosophical or religious approach, believing, hoping, motivating, advising, discovering, etc. So you can see all of them here and uh, again, uh, read them at your leisure and uh, try to see how this works in your own chart and the chart of people uh, around you or uh, of clients or things that you are studying. So this is, uh, let's look at the moon again. Uh, she is the planet of careful attention. She's a lovely warm planet. She receives, she stores, she retains, she responds. So it's the anticipatory dreamlike and caring approach. So that's uh, that's an interesting way of thinking about how these things work in a chart so that's how you free yourself from the bounds of uh, of whatever binds you in a certain place right so now with this long introduction i'm coming to the zoidia the representations the images so well <clears throat> This is really something because uh, what Schmidt did was by understanding how the Greeks uh, talked about the uh, planets and the uh, zoidia, um, what we now call uh, signs, which is not a good uh, term for that, but uh, in the appendix to this video, the, I will explain uh, why he used the word uh, representation or image for the word zoidion or zoidia plural. Um, the interesting thing is that he noticed something in the texts when he read about them. So, and he called that astrogramma. Um, it's very clear that in Hellenistic astrology, planets are primarily understood to be verbs. And why is that? Because verbs do things and they have references to time. And if you look at the list of characteristics that belong to the 12 images in Hellenistic astrology, the large list of these, all these characteristics are all with almost without exceptional ad, uh, exception adverbial. Of course, when you are able to read ancient Greek, which he was very uh, good at. So an adverb is a word or an expression that modifies a verb. So an adverb that has to do with uh, the images and a verb has to do with a planet. That's interesting. He also said that the interesting thing is that the sun, or uh, as an example, um, the planets have topics, but the images never have. So in all these things that he could read in the ancient text, he never saw uh, specific topics used uh, in relation with Zoidia, with uh, uh, images. For instance, when we nowadays say we have to look at somebody's relation, people almost immediately say that has something to do with uh, Libra, with uh, the uh, scales. And that's not true, simply because in those ancient texts, uh, the images were never associated with uh, specific topics. They simply had to do with modifications of activities that were indicated by planets. So planets had to do with topics. For instance, here is the example of the sun signifies the father, great rank, the king, etc., which are topics and the uh, images or the image where the sun is found, Helios, says something about how this manifests in somebody's life. So that's quite a difference. So let's look at an, an interesting definition of what an adverb is. Uh, Wikipedia says that adverbs typically express manner, place, time, frequency, degree, level of certainty, etc. So, so this almost looks like chart delineation, right? 
how, in what way, when, where, and to what extent. That's, that's actually exactly what we try to address with astrology, right? So that's very interesting because uh, uh, a grammar has a lot to do with uh, what's uh, in a chart and with what is what can be seen with the chart. So that's really interesting. So uh, as the uh, Stoics said, etymology is the key that unlocks reality. And this was one of the very interesting findings of Robert Schmidt when he was studying this material. And grammar is all the distinctions in the verbs of mood, tense and voice, mood. We were just talking about plas uh, planets being sensitive organs, sense organs which have to do with certain tenses or moods and uh, a voice uh, that's not quite uh, interesting uh, to associate with perhaps uh, uh, how you understand things, but it's certainly perhaps a voice that speaks inside you in, a, in an emotional way, could be. So, and the other interesting thing is that grammar as a science came on the scene in roughly the same period as Hellenistic astrology. So that was around the third century BC. Very interesting. So let's have a look at that. I will uh, address the issue of the uh, images by three topics. They're essential and accidental qualities, the images and personality traits, which is a very interesting and very important part of a chart delineation, and the essential dignities, which is uh, conceptualized as the issue of oikiosis. That's a Greek word. We'll get to that. Okay, so the images, their essential and their ac accidental qualities. So this is uh, something that Ptolemy, uh, Ptolemy uh, uh, stated about the uh, images. Uh, there are three of them, masculine, feminine, feminine images, sorry, the four elemental qualities, air-like, water-like, etc., and the three quadruplicities. These are the only characteristics of the images that they have on their own as a principle, because there are also many accidental qualities of planets, which we will address later. So now I will not spend much time on this. I think everybody knows this. There are masculine images, or you could say positive images, and feminine uh, feminine images, which are called the negative images, which you need to understand as energy-like, not as a qualification for either good or bad. So uh, the feminine uh, images on planets have a lot of uh, uh, trouble often tr finding their true place, but it's not passive, as uh, Schmidt said, but it is providing resistance to something, which is also an active mode or a rather a reactive mode to doing something. So it's still active in that sense. So you could say it's sort of a, the yin yang of, uh, of the images, how they uh, um, follow up each other uh, as positive, negative, positive, negative, etc. But the thing with Ptolemy is that he used a very interesting uh, a thing which you can put into question because what is wrong with the bull being a female image a bull is a male animal so what's up with uh, the bull being a female image so there's more going on here than we meet at the first glance so one of the other uh, essential qualities of uh, images is are the quadruplicities the modes of manifestation manifestation sorry um, so this is again this uh, very interesting uh, scheme of the images and the planets that belong to them, starting with Aries as the first place, but that is because that is the place of uh, the uh, spring effect. So it all has to do with uh, tropical and solstitial images, which are uh, the crab and the goat horned one or Capricorn as, as it's now known. Uh, simply because something changes, the path of the sun changes in uh, the crab and in the uh, goat horned one, uh, these are the significations that were given to them. So the uh, things, planets there change suddenly, their significations are turned around or something like that. So a tropical sign will therefore cut off or abruptly re sorry, reverse its effect and not bring something to conclusion or might break it off, not to be finished. The equinoctial signs, which are the ram and uh, the scales, uh, Libra, uh, 
can be about initiating or bringing to a conclusion, but they also something changes there, but rather more slowly, more gradually, which is the, what is uh, the mode of manifestation of a planet in them. And then we have the other two possibilities, which is the solid images and the double bodied ones. Again, I need not go deeply into those because everybody knows these, I think. And Schmidt said something about this. He said about verb and adverb that what happens in a fixed or a better word is solid image is more lasting or stable or unchangeable or something of that kind but it can easily easily be turned into an adverbial description it happens in a lasting manner or it happens in a fixed manner whatever you like to do uh, to formulate this so this is a very interesting way of trying to get to grips with how a planet manifests itself when it's in a certain image which has these characteristics when it is a tropical uh, image an equinoctial one a solid or a, a double-bodied image and there are uh, examples of these like this uh, they come from uh, the book of firmicus maternus the Mathesis. Uh, he lived in the fourth century uh, Annus Domini, uh, this after uh, Christ. The, the first example, in fixed signs, Mercury produces important judges or record keepers in tropical signs. He indicates occupations having to do with translation and money changing. And th there's the word changing. A translation is changing something into something else, as is money changing. In equinoctial signs, you have public officials in double signs, signs he makes the natives, natives intelligent, inventors, astronomers, etc. If you look at uh, the tropical degrees of uh, the number 42, those who have Saturn in Capricorn, that is in tropical degrees, will have their whole life and resources subject to constant reverses, which is one of these uh, significations of the tropical images. The highest step of fortune and then slip back again or the other way around so here you see some practical examples of how the uh, images modify the way uh, a planet or uh, the, a planet uh, actually manifests itself in concrete life so the double signs for instance if uh, you must remember that if the house of children is found in double signs there are children from two wives and if the signs is fixed fixed the man will have children from one wife or the wife from one husband so here you see a quite literal interpretation of these uh, 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 essential qualities of uh, the images but there are also accidental images uh, principles uh, accidental significations so um I quoted the one from Leopold of Austria, who is a 13th, uh, 13th century astrologer, but his list is quite uh, long and quite uh, quite uh, uh, long and big, I think. Uh, there are other ones which are a bit more sparse, but it's very interesting to see that these are all specific things associated with specific images which has to do with uh, the things that can be found in these images and this is what uh, schmidt said about it these accidental significations are due to the presence of certain fixed stars but we know now fixed stars move although very slowly and they are also associated with the constellations that constitute the images and these change due to the precession and then Schmidt said something very interesting. He said, this would then imply that we would have to restate these characteristics to account for the precession of the spring equinox, as these significations were given in relation to the sidereal zodiac. So that's an interesting thing, because he once said, or uh, hinted, that you can say that the tropical zodiac can be seen as the original, of which the sidereal zodiac is the image. I will not go deeper in this, but this is a very loaded sentence because everything in the Plantonic thinking was always about the image and the original. And uh, I think people who know something about Platonic philosophy will uh, understand what the, the, the weight of this sentence. And in astrology, that's also very interesting to understand the tropical zodiac, which starts at zero degrees of uh, the ram, Aries, and uh, uh, 30 uh, 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 degrees 30 portions each is of course the tropical zodiac which is a fixed 
uh, zodiac in the sense that it has that which is actually sort of a a, a, a model uh, which does not exist in reality, which is of course an original what simply exists in the mind or whatever, wherever. And the sidereal zodiac is the image of that. So there's an original and there's an image. And I will say no further, but that's very interesting to understand about this. So you can use these principles to try to get another grip on the mode of how a certain planet will manifest. So you can see, for instance, there are uh, images that are sterile, which are a few children, which are, I can see as uh, the ram and the bull, a few children. Um, sterile are uh, the, the twins, the lion and the virgin, etc. So when a planet is there, then the, the things that the planet will produce are few because it will not happen in a prolific way but in a sterile way which means that they do not produce as much as they could perhaps produce when they were in a very uh, lustful or prolific image so these are the the modes in which planets can manifest themselves that's very in important to understand okay okay second topic very important in uh, our astrology is of course the personality traits now when we look at the ancient uh, texts about the nature of the 12 zoidia the 12 images you get uh, descriptions like i have, i show here aries is the house of aries that is mars it's a masculine zoidian tropical the rest etc etc and this uh, you can see very little about certain personality traits in this and these sort of descriptions are very uh, general and all are always repeated throughout history up to until the modern age and then they change into something we know now and we now meet in uh, in our social media constantly which is like this and um, well there's no better word for this than sound bites so there's something interesting going on with this and uh, we can uh, alter or correct this view which is a very a simplistic one mm -hmm. and try to come to grips with what actually is said about uh, the images uh, and how they relate to personality traits so let's have a look at that again this is a very interesting example and i always show this because it's such a funny one simply because uh, the the significations given to uh, specific images are not as we uh, uh, as modern astrologers came to know them so let's have a look at them it's uh, by al biruni it's a well-known name in uh, traditional circles an astrologer of the 11th century and he wrote a little book called the art of astrology and this is what he said about the 12th images now i highlighted some of the things that i find very interesting and also a bit amusing uh, like these for instance i had never associated uh, the ram with a love of poetry i'm uh, i'm an heiress myself with the sun there but i'm not sure if that has something to do with uh, these qualifications but i will i will get to that uh, now have you ever heard that a uh, gemini is violence that the virgin is liberal and that the bowman is prejudiced uh, uh, the uh, sagittarius yeah could be because they are often very uh, convinced about uh, a certain principles so in that sense you could say they're prejudiced okay but capricorn fond of games changeable capricorn really <laughs> and pisces as bold no no i've I had as a, a student of astrology i had never seen these uh, significations given to the uh, the 12 images so what's going on here so yeah really no i don't think so there's something going on here and something has changed in this very profoundly and it's sorry to say has a lot to do with what happened to uh, modern astrology uh, around the turn of the century in the 1900s but okay let's have a look at what Fetches Fallens did. So he gives what you can see here uh, specific uh, characteristics, uh, uh, 
for the uh, image of the ram so they will be bright notable commanding just with a hatred of knaves free authoritative etc etc but he says that's only under the condition uh, when they are born in this oidion in accordance with the rulership relation so the the question is what is it that he means with in accordance with the rulership relation of course it refers to the ruler of a certain image which of course here is uh Ares, mars Ares. um so what is he talking about is it when the ruler is in his domicile for instance mars or the sun the exaltation ruler of Ares in Ares, or is it when Ares is the rising image the ascendant etc uh, th these possible qualifications could be given and i think it's about these and i guess everybody would agree we're talking about the rising image and especially the ruler of of the rising image or a planet in the ascendant and as not to forget the image where the moon is so um we can find this in ancient uh, literature and also in uh, hellenistic literature the uh, literature that these are most probably the ones uh, refer to when talking about the rulership relation so when you have this then you can say that these characteristics are for you that's what it's saying if you have an Aries ascendant then you will recognize these things these principles these characteristics of your personality but then uh, Valen says something very interesting in accordance with that or uh, in addition sorry which is when the rulers are well situated and testified to by benefics, the natives become kingly, powerful, and have the power of life and death. So something important is said here, because when the rulership relation is supported by the chart, so well situated and testified to by benefics, then certain qualifications of the image of the ram become more powerful, more exalted as it were so it's almost as if you see the exaltation rule of the ram which is helios the sun is somehow enhanced or brought to the fore more that's interesting he says something equal about the lion if the ruler should happen to be upon a pivot hey there we have a certain qualification or should be with benefits they will become bright esteemed tyrannical kingly so you can see that specific qualities of the, in this case, the ram or the lion become enhanced whenever the rulers are placed well. And that's a very interesting take on uh, uh, the, the specification of qualities of character by these planets. So you can have an image where uh, these conditions go. And when these are supported by the strength, because when they are angular, they are very uh, important and central in the natives chart or testified to by benefics then the better uh, things of the qualities of an image get enhanced that's very interesting so this leads to certain conclusions for instance when we restrict the qualifications of character simply to these images then you can say that not everything is you in your chart as to personality traits you don't own every possible outcome or every possible character or, or quality of a certain image simply by uh, the fact that it's in your chart it has to be under certain conditions and not all qualities of an image are given for you to develop at liberty or to simply choose from to your liking so that's a very important uh, difference to make and this also implies that when the ruler is badly situated and under uh, uh, the testimony of malefics then uh, perhaps the more evil or difficult qualities of an image might present themselves as a characteristics of a certain person so that's uh, not perhaps nice to know but it's just being being real right let's get real okay again the here's our magic sentence all things being equal we have to check everything in the chart and try to understand what is happening to a certain planet or a certain principle of an image and here you see how all things being equal has to do with you can have a certain uh, image as your ascendant but it's the quality of the rulers that have a lot to do with how this will manifest in your life so let's look at this further which is again he says this uh, whatever the ruler does 
is also goes also for the image so when the ruler is not well placed the image cannot produce its best qualities okay so then we get to the issue of essential dignity which also has to do with this quality issue okay let's look at that for a minute for all your finest stars now what is happening is in uh, the later tradition um, astrologers started counting up these uh, specific principles of uh, dignification so uh, a, a planet being in its own place in its own domicile got five points a planet being in its exaltation four points etc and this suggested that this had something to do with strength which is uh, not correct in the sense that uh, i will explain uh, later because what they're doing is something like this they are saying i have a bike i have a moped and i have a small car and when i add them up i actually have a sort of a, a truck and it's of course a very silly uh, thing to think because it has nothing to do with strength so forget this don't count them up but it has to do something about multitasking not strength why because planets have certain functions for their images which is a certain task they uh, do they have for a certain image so when you have more planets uh, being in their own places in a certain image you cannot say that they grow stronger but they have a more uh, more tasks to fulfill for this specific image that's a different thing okay another thing that this uh, idea about quality uh, when a domicile lord is in its own place the quality of that planet is very good you can say a lot of things about that but it can be altered a bit and i will do this now i think this is quite a good um, signification of what a, a planet in own domicile etc means but it's also a bit different from what i'm presenting now because we will now get to the principle of what is going on with this principle uh, what is an oikos an oikos is a house so oikeosos is the principle that schmidt translated as familiarization which was again a very loaded word in uh, philosophy so an oikos is a house so you can say that uh, uh, this is the house of uh, the bull and there's an exaltation planet which is the moon and we have certain bound rulers which are mars jupiter etc and we have a domicile ruler which is venus and um so when a planet is in a certain house uh, sorry in a certain image uh, which which we will now call a domicile of uh, of a chart uh, the domicile of uh, the bull in this case you can say that the planet that is there is a visitor in this place in this house so and some images have better stuff than others you could say whenever the malef malefics are ch ruling a certain place they can say that the other ones have better stuff so but that's just kidding right for the terminology the concepts we have to again address the issue of the words used for certain principles you can say that this is a house and these are places so that's the difference between a place and a domicile a house is a domicile where a planet resides or a planet is a guest and a place is what we now call a house which is the one of the 12 places where there is an image and there is a planet perhaps so understand this that's a difference so you can say that um, if we can talk about an owner and a staff of a certain image so you can say uh, each image has an ensemble of executive you can so you can say that it's the crew right so and it's the manner in which a sign uh, is associated with planets by means of rulership and rulership is again uh, an interesting word that we need to uh, examine so let's have a look at that so we have domicile lords traditional ones the moon for uh the crab the helios the sun for the line etc but we also have exaltation lords so what's going on with this and that's interesting so i have a very interesting example uh, i think everybody has seen this series because i know it was popular all over the world downton abbey and it's about this guy 
who owns Downton Abbey. And it's about this guy also, who is the butler, but he manages and controls the goings on in Downton Abbey. So that's a very interesting dif uh, difference between these two functions. The one is the owner and the other one is the manager. The, uh, and um, uh, the reason why this is important is that Schmidt said that at a certain point he said, uh, it is actually the exaltation ruler that is the owner of the uh, of the specific image and the uh, the uh, domicile ruler is sort of the butler of the uh, image of that that domicile so the one is the owner which he associated with the exaltation ruler and the other one is the one who manages the affairs there so that's interesting so we have a domicile master and we have an exaltation lord. And this is again what Schmidt thought about these things. And he got a lot of resistance with it, but I think it can be explained. Now we said the word oikodespotes is normally translated by everyone as ruler, but it actually means domicile master. It can be the lord of the household, the lord of the manor, but it can also be the master of the estate, which in older times was the steward, the one who uh, managed the the uh, the business going on in the house so uh, the butler here is managing the issues of downtown abbey so the same word can mean both now schmidt said that the task of the domicile master is being the good host the architector that's where the word comes from Zdekpor is from decomai to give ear to something to receive to take on to take up to take up on one, uh, upon oneself etc to receive in a welcoming way. So that's the guest host relationship. And that's interesting, but also interesting is that the word oikodespotea is used for the domicile, the exaltation lord, the bound lord, and the triplicity rulers. So what is going on there? They, they are all called a master of a domicile. So that's interesting. But you can also see that the domicile master in this uh, understood in this sense has to do with the archetype of the moon because the domicile master takes care of the guests so that she's the good host and the exaltation lord is the archetype of the sun because he's simply the owner that's my place shut up something like that so when you look at uh, the division and try to understand what's going on here you can have a look at this principle sect and hyes uh, everybody uh, i'm assuming everybody knows what this is about it's about day and night charts uh, and uh, when a planet is Hayes, based on sect conditions, that means that a day planet is in a day image, a masculine image, and a female, uh, sorry, a night planet is in a female image, and they can be above or below the horizon, etc., and thus be in an image of the right gender. Now, when you look at this, and you look at the images of the right gender, you see this. For instance, the sun is a day planet, and Aries, uh, the, the ram, which is its sign of exaltation, is the sign of the right gender. And you see that Mars is the domicile ruler of that place. Venus is a night planet, and she's exalted in, uh, the, in Pisces, the fishes, and that's a female image, so it's a sign of the right gender. If you look at Saturn, Saturn is exalted in the scales, Libra, and that's a sign of the right gender, it's a masculine image. And uh, so that's the exaltation ruler. So what you see is that the planet that is not of the favorite sect is the servant. That's an interesting thing to take into account. Uh, and in the ancient text, uh, Schmidt wrote a book called uh, Definitions and Foundations. And there it is said that the domicile master and the exaltation lord are joint domicile masters. They both have a sort of an authority type relation to a certain image. That's interesting. There are three exceptions that are these. I will not go into them, but let me show you something. Uh, this is also interesting. You see that some uh, images do not have an exaltation ruler, and these are all uh, male images. The, the domiciles preferred by diurnal planets do not have any planet at all as their exaltation lords so they don't have a planet uh, and they don't have to share an image with the other one so that's the reason why they uh, 
are in their joy in these places. So that just to let you know, right? And also very important, there are no instances of delineations being generated by studying a planet in the exaltation of another planet. Keep that in mind because this has something to do which I can perhaps talk about in another webinar because it's a very interesting and far-reaching principle of uh, delineation in traditional astrology. Now let's have a look at again the Thema Mundi. There are two planets that have to do with action, praxis, which is doing and making, which is literally one of the words used for uh, describing these planets. So that is R is Mars, which has to do with action. And the second one is Helios, the Sun, action and mastership. And in this vision, the idea is that a planet, which is the domicile master, ruler is actually a planet in the surface of the exaltation ruler so mars action is in the surface of helios the sun which has to do with action and mastership and that's very easily demonstrated because mars is the soldier which is obeying and executing orders and the sun is the commander and that's the one giving orders so when you look at the 10th place in the thema mundi that's the ram, that's the domicile of Aries, Mars, and the exaltation of Helios, the sun. So you see this principle demonstrated actually in this, uh, this uh, uh, Thema Mundi. So again, there is no 12 letter alphabet in Hellenistic astrology that associates Aries, the ram, with the first place. No, it's associated with the 10th place having to do with action, right? Now let's look at the first place. There are three planets that have to do with birth. In the first place is the crab, the domicile of Selene, the moon, exaltation of Zeus, and the joy of Hermes. Now, Selene is the uh, domicile ruler, so it's the servant, actually, of, in this case, Jupiter. Jupiter is the begetting of children, so what is in service of begetting children, conception, the nurse, the home. And then we have Mercury, which is the planet of children, youth, education of children, the lord of brothers and younger children pretty pretty stuff pretty strong symbolism that's what i meant okay three planets have to do with religion specifically it's also a very nice one take ninth place the fishes the domicile of zeus the exaltation of aphrodite and the joy of helios the sun okay now aphrodite is about rituals of purification priestly rites piety religious observance etc and Zeus is Jupiter, Gnosis, preferment of priests. So Venus, sorry, uh, Zeus is in the service of Venus. So the priests are in service of the rituals of purification, the rites, piety and religious observance. Pretty clear to me. And Helios, the son, is the not only the high priest, but it's also God, right? And the ninth place is the place of God. Okay. Next issue. I'm sorry it's a long-winded presentation, but it's also hopefully very illustrating for you. So let's look at the planets and the images, the guest and the host relation. Now, to me, this is a very important one because it made such a difference for me in understanding what's happening when a planet is in a certain image and what the domicile master, being the good host, does or provide for the guest which is in its domicile, right? So here we have actually the question that you can answer with what stuff does the visiting planet in an image work in this image? What, what does he have to work with? You can also say what is the building material that this planet has at its disposal to try to make something of it? And, and again, this is the, the uh, completion of all the, the possible uh, principles the planet in an image in certain circumstances a certain place so you can answer this with all this and my um, understanding of this is actually that a planet in an image can be seen as sort of a potter and the host can be seen as the clay with which a planet in an image can uh, try to make a good pot right so you can, and what's interesting about that is that you can say, or you can ask yourself the question, is this an able potter? Is, he, is this a very good artisan? Is this planet able to use this material to try to make something 
out of the clay that it's provided to him. But you can also ask, is this good material? What is the quality of the planet that this planet in this image has to work with? Is it the clay of good quality? So when you try to think about this, this is a very important way of understanding what ha what's happening with planets in certain images when they are uh, uh, have a, a certain planet as its host. Now, and I will show you how important this is. Because when I started reading ancient delineation recipes with this in mind, it led to a very new take on what is actually written in them. So let's have a look at this one. The Liber Hermetis says that Mars is, uh, when uh, Saturn is in Aries or in uh, the Scorpion, Mars is the host and he provides for Saturn. And you can also say that Saturn can actually do with Mars stuff to his liking and does so in accordance with his own Saturnine nature. And this is what uh, Liber Hermetis says. which is quite uh, revealing, I think. So when Saturn is in sect in the house of Mars, or his face, which most probably means it's decan, or degree, uh, it makes the completing of a task, which is something of Mars, completing a task, doing something, it makes it difficult, which is a Saturnine thing. Those who have made enemies, Mars, evilly, but you can also turn this around, enemies, Saturn, evilly, Mars. Evilly incriminated traitors, same goes there, subjected men. Why? Saturn defeats Mars. Mars is the principle of victory and Saturn defeats it. So defeated men, subjected men. The impulse of Mars makes an ignoble youth and it makes slothful men. Slothful is uh, somebody who's a bit lazy. And that's what Saturn does with the action-driven Mars and those evilly occupied in their affairs, which is how Saturn does Mars. So, wow, this is uh, pretty amazing stuff. So with this guest host principle, it's very interesting to see that these statements have nothing to do with the characteristics of either the, the ram or uh, the scorpion. But simply, it's all about uh, the planets, and that's the reason why I think that planets were never delineated in images in ancient texts. When a planet is in an image of another planet, it's always formulated like this, uh, what the, the guest does with the, map, the, the stuff that the host actually represents, which is a very interesting take on how planets manifest themselves in images. So that's quite a different take on how we now understand how planets and images work, right? Okay, uh, this is the, uh, the, the night uh, uh, delineation of Saturn, Saturn being in a night chart, not of the favorite sect. You can read it in your own time because, well, actually it says the same thing. Saturn does something with Mars. So again, it's about what Mars, oh, sorry, what Saturn, the guest does with Mars, the host and what the result is. And that's really interesting. So forget images and think planets when you're thinking about what a planet in a certain image actually does or represents. Think about what the, the guest does with the material that the host puts at its disposal, which is again, a very interesting uh, other take. So that's the familiarization principle. So let's have an, an idea about what's happening when Saturn is in uh, an image of uh, Aries Mars, you can say that familiarization, the process is actually something about that Saturn must try to adapt to all these Aries Mars things he is surrounded with and he's actually working with the material and it has a certain outcome. And uh, it's pretty strictly written in this uh, text from uh, the Liber Hermetis. But you can say in a more modern sense that Saturn needs to learn to handle the things that Mars is presenting. He must learn to use them. He must familiarize himself with them. So the environment that this Corona Saturn is in is already in a certain way prepared or preformed. And it has all the characteristics of the domicile master, Aries Mars. And Corona Saturn is in a manner of speaking surrounded by this martial environment and he make he must make his home there i find these these sentences very very 
revealing you must make your home there isn't that what we are trying to do with our own life with our own chart we need to get at home we must familiarize ourselves with our own chart and how do we do that and with these 12 specific fate concepts which are the 12 places how do we deal and cope with them how do we get familiar with them this is such a rich language I really find it's invigorating for my astrology. So this is what Saturn Kronos has to familiarize himself with, which is a very adequate way of conceptualizing life and dealing with your chart. You are constantly, I am constantly familiarizing myself with my own chart by means of each planet in a certain domicile. And by means of the domicile art, I need to familiarize myself and I am familiarizing myself simply because my life, uh, um, how, how do I say this? Simply because my life puts me in these circumstances and that's how I um, learn them and evaluate them and try to handle them and then try to use them and make them my own. So. In the case of this example, you can say that when Saturn is in uh, the ram or in the scorpion, he needs to learn to interact with the events, persons and objects that have an Aries Mars nature and needs to coexist, uh, coexist with them, make use perhaps of the events that are presented in these places. Uh, he must get used to them and he must learn to handle them. Now. Of course, when it's Saturn, he has a specific way of doing that, which is his own principal nature. And how does Saturn normally deal with this task? By agnoia. Uh, he doesn't notice them, he's oblivious to them, or he wants to avoid them or ignore them. And when he does realize them, he has a, hopefully the stoic approach. Uh, by patience, uh, starting from scratch, training and practice, discipline and patience. And this is, to me, a very rich way of thinking about what planets do with other planets when they are in certain images. But uh, something very important needs to be said here, which has to do with the nature of Mars in these cases. So, so I need to emphasize this. Um, no general statement is made here about Mars in these places and by the fact that Saturn uh, can make use of the, uh, the clay that Mars is providing for this uh, potter, which is Saturn uh, Kronos, in an image of Aries. So they say nothing about the quality of Aries Mars in the chart as such. Why? Because we need to evaluate Mars on its own terms which have nothing, nothing to do with what Saturn in either Aries or in uh, the, the Scorpion is doing with the principles of Mars, because Mars is a planet in its own right and it needs to be evaluated in its own right. And it's uh, located in a certain image and it's located uh, in a certain place and that gives it its own specific meaning. So that's very important. And also, what is also very interesting is that when you have more than one planet in a certain image, which is uh, 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 several potters working with the same clay, then these planets will have to be interpreted separately as to what they exactly can accomplish with this clay that, uh, Mar uh, that Mars uh, supplies them with. So there is a very interesting thing. They all do different things with what Mars is offering them. Why? Because they have their own nature and they do things in their own way. So that's, it merely says what planet X, Y or Z is doing with Mars, which is acting as its host. Please understand this because that might be confusing at first. It says nothing about Mars itself. It simply says what the guest is doing with the host Mars. So if you have three planets in these images, then Mars is shaped in three different ways by the planets. So it's a very subtle concept and I also understand that this is happening for each planet in perhaps in relation to another uh, place simply because these planets in, in the ram or in the uh, scorpion are the rulers of several houses in the, the chart so okay so this is again a very interesting uh, uh, 
conceptualization of the principle of how these planets can function in images. They do something with their host. They're not completely free as to do something with these hosts, but nonetheless, it's very important when you read these ancient delineations, you can see how, log how logical the principles are that are stated there. When you stop thinking about the image itself, but what the planet is doing with its, uh, uh, its uh, host. Okay, I will recapitulate what I'm what I've presented in this webinar for you. So uh, simply as a reminder, it's not uh, it's simply to understand, oh yeah, this was a very long talk and what the hell were you talking about? Well, this is it. So you can understand planets to be sort of passive faculties of the soul, the receiving end of planets, planets in places, and planets also have an active mode as rulers of places. So you can call that task awareness, leading, taking action, and devising solutions for problems happening in certain places, then the planet has a certain active mode, you can say. Okay, also understand that planets signify things and topic, which are topics in daily life, and the characteristics of images are not topics, but they are modifications of activities. They are adverbial. Okay. Next thing, images have essential and accidental qualities that show how the topics of planets manifest when they are in a certain image. Interesting. Also, uh, images are also often associated with uh, character traits and personality, etc. But please understand that they are most probably solely dependent on the image that is the ascendant and the image that ha has the moon in it. And also understand that the more excellent significations of these images as character traits uh, only manifest when the rulers are well situated and testified to by benefics, which is what Valen says, which is also a very interesting thing to, to research in charts to understand how this is working and functioning. Again, images have an ensemble of planets as their administrators. You could say that they are their crew and these have nothing to do with strengths, so don't count them up, but they have merely a task to fulfill for an image or part of an image, which is, for instance, the bounds. Uh, I, I've only talked simply about uh, the host of an, of an image, and I would love to do a webinar about the other possible meanings, um, but these are something for later, perhaps, hopefully. <laughs> I'm just putting out an effort here, right? Okay, planets and images are best understood as having a guest host domicile master relation, uh, as I explained in my previous uh, slides, which is to me the most mind blowing thing that I've ever understood about astrology, which is what a planet in an image is doing with its host. It's very interesting and very, very deep, a deep level of, uh, of what, what's going on in a chart. So the concept of oikiosis, familiarization, is a very adequate way of conceptualizing life in general and dealing with your own chart specifically. So this is uh, what I try to uh, present to you here. So check this with your friends, family, and your loved ones, for it's a very interesting way of getting deeper into uh, uh, the meaning of what planets mean in uh, certain images and houses, uh, sorry, places. So uh, with this, I come to the end of my presentation. Sorry, it took a long time. I, I apologize for its length, but because when you're new to this material, it's very uh, challenging perhaps, and it might be very exhausting, but um, I hope I have achieved something what Schmidt always tried to do with his presentations, which is what he called habit breaking, because when you're a long time involved with astrology, you get certain habits and ways of thinking and conceptualizing these things, which have to, which become stale in a certain way because they are so ingrained in your mind. Uh, because, uh, let me give an example. I was uh, trained as a, a psychological astrologer, and I the ABC system, uh, uh, Aries is the first place and Mars is also, and uh, the bull is the second place and Venus also. That is always 
in my mind that I need to fight that habit of thinking about uh, the places and what the significations of the places are uh, with this stuff going on. I need to fight this habit of mine of thinking about the chart and the significations of the places in this way. So this habit breaking, I, oh, I hope I've done that in a certain way, uh, rethinking the concepts, which is very interesting it's sometimes challenging but it's also very interesting because you get a fresh look at these principles which is uh, what what's made what keeps it interesting all the time but i know that's also a bit annoying and sometimes even angering to have your habitual understanding of something challenged as i uh, experience all the time it's uh, it's no uh, it, it's not something that only students of astrology meet when they are just starting their studies in astrology it's something that's happening to me as well and i have a who oh, i started i started doing astrology in 1983 so it's a long time going on and i still have to fight it so habit breaking right so i hope i've done schmidt honor with his uh, with this presentation and that you will benefit from it i hope very much that you will and um, I will also put this video on my YouTube channel, so it will be available for further study because I think it's rather much. So thank you for listening and thank you for your patience and thank you Akuta for making this webinar possible. Thank you Delia for your kind assistance. And whenever you have further questions, please mail me at this mail address. So thank you. This was it. This was my talk. Uh, Martin, I just have to um, say what an unbelievably rich uh, <laughs> talk this has been, and you, you are you. so knowledgeable about all of these topics, and I just think that we're so fortunate uh, that you are here to um, walk us through all of this, and uh, you've taken us so far beyond the 12th letter alphabet. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Like Thank stomped you. it into the dust. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I really love that you're that you will be sharing this talk on your uh, YouTube channel because um, I know that this uh, I personally am looking forward to rewatching it several times and just uh, to keep extracting layers of meaning um, mm. out of it. So uh, that's that's great. That's great. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have. Um, I have a comment here. One person saying that they could be here for um, hours more. <laughs> uh, somebody else is saying that this has been like 10 webinars in one. So uh, yeah, the replay will be very valuable. Um, I will put your um, YouTube, the link to your YouTube channel in the chat box for everybody. Thank you. And, uh, and so um, we have time for uh, questions still. So there are some questions that have come in already in the Q&A chat box. Ah, okay. Uh, you should be able to see them there. I invite mm. um, people to type in your questions if you haven't already. Um, uh, can I see this one? Ah, here. Yeah, I can see the chats. Um, and I would just... Uh, ask you to read the question out loud, please, for as well for those who are rewatching on the recording. Okay, I, I see a lot of, um, I'm not sure which one. Uh, wow. Uh, I only see great <laughs> support for what I did. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not seeing questions so far, perhaps we did last time you you uh, put your your own uh, uh, picture on screen and mine as well. And then you read uh, uh, questions to me because I, I cannot see them. Ah. Sure. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly. Okay, so um, question from Betty. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious about Martin's rather psychological approach. In an ancient context, we usually look at the planets as representing other people, events, etc., outside of ourselves. Although right. they may indicate, although they may also indicate our nature, how does uh, Martine reconcile the more modern psychological point of view with the ancient, less psychological, although admitting that sometimes, although admitting that sometimes the planet as, act as demoni? Yeah. Um... I don't. I uh, I try to. This is also something that I need to uh, that I struggle with because my first 
training was as a psychological astrologer. So I, I always, my first instinct is to try to understand the planets as being something psychological. So I have to do, I have to take a step back and try to see if, oh, my own personality. For instance, um, let me give an example. When somebody's talking about Mercury, they always uh, talk about, this is my style of communicating with people. But it's very strange when you have a, a traditional astrology, which only associates my personality with my first image. So, um, so it, which in my case is the crab. So my personality is very strongly influenced by uh, the essence of what the crab is and where the moon is. And that has a lot to do with the way that I communicate. So you could say that everything is contained in the principles of the uh, that I explained about what makes an image something of your own personality and the other ones are simply things outside of me right so in that case I uh, really agree very much with what she said about uh, the difference between modern and traditional astrology so I'm not sure if that answers the question but yes I do make a difference between them but I always my first go is it's something psychological and then I have to step back and say no this is about somebody else this is another person in my life yeah I hope that answers the question thank you Martin uh from Radha Devi Om if we interpret Saturn to be all shame ugly etc then mm -hmm. where's the room for having Saturn uh provide good karmic lessons and growth well, um, that is simply by means of the way that Saturn has something to do with shame, etc. So you can say that each planet makes you aware of something in your life, which uh, has to do with a certain feeling that you have, or something that has to do with, when we talk about Saturn, it sometimes has, has to do with shame. So that is the way the planet attracts your attention to its own principle. And that is when you start looking for answers to, so how do I solve this? So that's the reason why I made a differentiation between how the planet feels as a principle of the soul, how you um, experience things in your life. And when Saturn is a planet by which you experience things in your life, it's by means of difficulties. And hopefully that puts you on a path to try to get to grips with whatever it is that you're uh, feel sh ashamed about or whatever else Saturn uh, provides for feelings for you. And then, well, you can call that karma, but I'm not sure if the ancient astrologers use the word or the principle of karma, but it simply says that each planet makes you aware of something in your own life by means of its own principles. And sadly, or hopefully, the principle that Saturn uh, uh, represents is the principle of agnoia. I don't want to know about this. I'm ashamed of it. I put it out as far. I put it in the dark, which is the opposite of the lights, something like that. Thank Does you. That uh, <laughs> I think it was a great response. So uh, from Thank Jennifer, you. um, my understanding was that the activity of a planet in the house results in the house of the ruler uh parentheses our hand says yeah. The, the yeah, comment. yeah and that the triplicity rulers were the managers on site this presents uh this presentation is in conflict with that i thought the ruler was not just the host and off-site manager but the owner any comment on this um well as I said in my talk, uh, Schmitz made the difference that the owner has to do with the exaltation ruler and the host has to do with the planet that provides something for a guest in its uh, domicile. Um, and I know the uh, host also has something to do with uh, how things manifest in, the, in, uh, in time, simply because very often the principles of uh, where the host is comes uh, associated with the planet that is the guest in a certain domicile. So I don't think that they are in conflict with each other, but please try to understand the principle of how the, uh, the, the guest 
uses the principles of the host as the stuff that he's working with. So if you read uh, the, the, the delineations in uh, the Liber Hermetus, you can see that very clearly. And um, yeah, it, it also has something to do with the bounds. You can see sort of the same sort of delineations with the ruler of the bounds. But the question is, what is the exact function of a bound ruler for a planet in its, uh, in its bounds? And that's what Schmidt was very adamant about. You cannot count these things up, but they are all have a, a different responsibility for the, the image they are uh, the bound ruler of in a certain place. So uh, yes, uh, I agree in the sense that the uh, domicile master, the ruler of a house, as we now call it, has something to do with the long-term effect of a planet. But please understand that the first principle is always the planet in a certain image uh, has to work with the material that the host provides for it. Well, at least that's a very interesting way of trying to understand what's happening in a certain image. So. Um, thank you. Question from Spencer. Uh, what does the exaltation lord provide versus the domicile lord, i.e. what is the function or role of the exaltation lord? The function and role of an exaltation lord is merely that it takes over the function, the role of the domicile master when that master is in aversion. And that's the principle of participation, which is defined in the book that Schmidt wrote, Definitions and Foundation. And there's also the, the uh, issue of the joint domicile master. Whenever a domicile ruler, the, the, the host of a certain image is in aversion to, its, uh, to the, its own image, then hopefully the domicile, uh, sorry, the exaltation ruler does uh, have an, a configuration with that sign, and then that planet takes over the magic managing uh, role of the of the said image. So whenever you have a, a planet in aversion to its own domicile, check out whether or not the uh, the exaltation ruler does see its own domicile. And that's the role of it. So it takes over, but that's the reason why I said that uh, Schmidt said there are no delineations found in ancient texts about what it means whenever a planet is in the exaltation of another planet. There are no delineations for that. So it simply means that that exaltation ruler takes over the function uh, that it rather would not have, namely being the butler of a certain guest, but it has to simply because the butler is not at home or <laughs> doesn't care. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, from Li Cheng. Um, regarding moving and being moved, how do you interpret if a planet is in its own domicile? Um, when a planet is in its own domicile, it actually is uh, the potter that is working with the clay that is producing itself. So whenever uh, uh, Ares is in its own image of the, the, uh, the scorpion or the, uh, the ram, then Ares, Mars is not dependent on another planet for its own resources. So it uses its own clay to make stuff with its own clay. So that's the interpretation of what, whenever a planet is in its own domicile. So it has its own resources to, so to speak. But it can be dependent or, or on whatever the uh, bound ruler is uh, advising this planet to do, because that's one of the functions of a bound ruler. Um, it forces the planet to work in its own uh, uh, strategy, by, uh, for lack of a better word to say it. So a bound ruler has much to say about wherefore the planet is used. But well, that's perhaps something for another webinar. The list keeps growing for future yeah. webinar topics. <laughs> um, follow, another question from Li Cheng. Uh, this is the first time that I hear that the ruler's condition doesn't matter towards the planet's pottery making in the ruler's ruling domicile. Correct me if I'm yes, wrong. Yes, it, it does. I, I said so because um, what you can do is, um, I'm talking about a potter and the clay, but you, what you can do with a certain 
planet of course each planet works according to its own nature but it also has a certain condition and that's the reason why i said you can ask whether or not this is a, a capable potter and if it's a capable potter you can also ask whether or not the clay it needs to work with is of a good quality or not so that's where the all things being equal comes into play you need to uh, evaluate what the condition of each planet is as to how good this material is and how good this potter can make something of it so you can have a very good material uh, Aries, for instance being in its own domicile and saturn being in the other domicile of aries uh no um saturn being in aries and mars in uh, its own image of the scorpion then you have a very good quality clay but saturn being in detriment or uh, in exile in uh, the ram is not such a capable uh, potter so the, the example of i gave of the Liber Hermetis is very clear about that. So Saturn really fouls up whatever uh, Mars is actually capable of doing. So people with Saturn uh, in Aries or Scorpio really got a benefit in this talk. I hope right? so. <laughs> yeah, in particular. So, um, okay, what about the ruler aspecting towards the planets in its domicile? Will that influence plant influence the planets doings in its domicile? Uh, when other planets are in uh, aspect to it? Was that the, the question? What about the ruler um, yeah. aspecting planets in its domicile? How does that influence? Uh, that's a very good thing, but it depends on the sort of uh, configuration. Um, but in, in essence, this is a very basic delineation. And the all things being equal proviso needs to take into account whatever else is happening to these planets. So when, for instance, uh, Saturn is in the uh, in, in uh, Aries or in the Scorpio, the the effects, uh, so Saturn is producing something there, which was this uh, adequately described by whatever um, uh, the Liber Hermetis said, but when it has a, a beautiful uh, trine of Jupiter, then the question is how serious will this affect this native in a bad way? Because whenever Jupiter is in an aspect with a planet, it tries to help and it tries to assuage every problem that a planet might uh, might indicate and then you have several timing techniques which say in what period of life what planet is uh, the chrono chronocrata and ruling the times so when it's saturn in that period it might be difficult uh, but jupiter might help so whenever one of these two gets the rulership of the times it says something about how things will manifest Thank you. Um, from Rachel, excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, what, what is the main vibe you'd say with planets that are domicile rulers in signs that have no exaltation ruler? So for example, Mercury in Gemini, the Sun in Leo, Saturn in Aquarius, and Mars in Scorpio. They have no owner and can act in full power and or self-service. So it's an interesting kind of ability to move. Uh, mm -hmm. Self-direction like an entrepreneur, question mark? Um, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, this is a very general way of, of trying to understand what's happening in each image. So whenever an image has a, an exaltation ruler, then you always have a planet in the service of that. So you can say that planets that have no exaltation ruler are, yeah, you could say self-dependent. Uh, they, they do not have to um, execute orders from another planet that is set above them so yeah in that sense you can say that they are self-sufficient in a way yeah yeah thank you from constanza can it be said that if a planet is in its exaltation but retrograde it's not so good and vice versa if the planet is in its fall but retrograde is it not so bad uh, no, when a planet's in its fall and retrograde, it's a, a double whammy. It's not good for the planet. When a planet is, is in its exaltation and retrograde, it simply uh, has to do whenever this planet is uh, uh, acting as a, a time lord, a chronocrator, then at that point, it will, uh, when it's a benefic, it will bestow its good, but it will take them back. And uh, 
an exalted an, an, uh, an exalted malefic retrograde often denies something at all so uh, when a benefic uh, is in the second house retrograde he gives its wealth but takes it back and whenever a malefic is in the second place all things being equal and retrograde it will prevent the native making money or much money something like that yeah uh several people have asked where can you purchase robert schmidt's definitions and foundations Ooh, i wish i could um um say that definitely um i'm I'm really hoping that this new website, which uh, will, is publishing all the talks that Robert Schmidt gave, will eventually also uh, provide the book Definitions and Foundations because it's a very important book. Um, but sorry, I, I don't know. I know that peop many people want this book. It's a very important book, but unfortunately it's not uh, out there for sale as far as I know. So unfortunately, but... I hoping I'm hoping that they will publish it on that website and you can purchase it there. But it's a very interesting book and uh, yeah, it's the foundation of uh, all this. Uh, well, that's a title: definitions and foundations. He also did a talking tour for that book, which is mind blowing and the agony that he had because it's simply about thirty uh, aphorisms, th uh, thirty definitions. And it took him five years to complete them. And there, there are only 30. And I said, well, if I just had translated them, it would have only took, taken me, what, a month, two months, three, three months, but it took him five years. So a lot was happening with uh, the translation of that, uh, uh, these, these definitions, but they are really very important. So well, perhaps the next talk. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, from, uh, from Jennifer, if there are no planets in the sign, does that mean that the clay is not being made into a pot? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, that's a good one. It's such a good one, I don't have an answer. No, I'm... Well, you can always, yeah, you could say that the, um, the planet itself, the ruler of the empty uh, image is actually doing its own stuff, being a, a, a guest, being a potter in another place. So perhaps you, these can be related with each other, but I must say I don't have an, have an, uh, an adequate answer to that question, but I think it's something along those lines. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Tom asks, do you use sidereal and tropical together at once no never no i'm just working with tropical uh, zodiacs one tropical zodiac right uh from dana would astrology theory mimic or be the same as math theory that's something sorry <sighs> Sorry, the question isn't so clear. Would astrology theory mimic or same as math theory that something is true, is false, is random? I don't think I quite understand the question. I don't know if you do. Neither uh, do I, no. Okay, Dana, if you're still around, uh, if you could rephrase your question and uh, type it into the uh, chat box. Um, okay, from Cindy. If a planet is in its exaltation, and the domicile lord of that sign is an aversion. Mm -hmm. Does the domicile ruler give away its role as a ruler of its sign to the exaltation ruler? Um, yes, but I understand it's always as trying to understand the the exaltation lord. Then, sort of, a, a, I'm not sure if the uh, exaltation lord provides its own clay. So we would have to research that in in more depth as i think uh, because what happens when a ruler is in a version it is actually turning away from its responsibility so whenever the um, domicile ruler of a certain place is in a version it's actually um uh, how do you say that it's actually not taking care of what it needs to do for that image so it's 
negligent of what it needs to do for that image. And that is a big problem because w uh, when also the, the exaltation ruler is in a version to that same image, then there's really a problem simply because no one is managing uh, in your life uh, the specific topic associated with that place. So that's uh, that's a big difficulty. It's better to have a planet in opposition to its own image than to have a planet in aversion to its own image. It's always uh, the case. Hmm. From Jennifer, is the condition of the ruler affecting the planet it rules? It mm -hmm. seems that maybe not in this de demonstration, the planet just uses his ruler's toolbox. Um, sorry, I missed the last uh, <laughs> Someone right. is knocking at your door. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. There's construction. It's no problem. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the question is: the condition of the ruler affecting the planet it rules? And she's saying that in this demonstration, it seems like the planet just uses its ruler's toolbox. It does. Again, this is referring back to the idea: is this good clay, or is this bad clay? And is the potter? an able potter or is he uh, somehow a deficient potter? So that has to do with the same question, I think, yeah. Right, um, from Spencer, what if you, what if the host is an aversion and there is no exaltation ruler? Then there's a problem. Then what you're hoping is that, uh, that another planet can uh, be in configuration with this uh, specific image. And there is a very interesting theory about uh, aspect formation uh, you can have a the ruler that is in a version can perhaps be in contact with a planet that can see that domicile and then that planet can by means of the other planet uh, have an influence on its own domicile and that's it has to do with testimony when uh, testimony has to do with I being an eyewitness. Uh, the aspect theory is about seeing or not seeing, and you can give testimony about something you have not seen. So a planet that is in a version with its own image cannot see its own image, but it can make contact with a planet that can see its image. And then it can perhaps via that planet have some sort of influence on that. But that's a, a quite an elaborate uh, doctrine that Schmidt introduced in his talk about Zodiac releasing. But uh, something like that could be going on that another planet takes the responsibility for the image that is left alone. Yeah. And whenever a planet is in such an image, it could be that that planet is going to uh, take care of the business of the place that the host does not uh, take care of. Yeah, is that clear? Uh, yes, he says, uh, thank you. Um, okay, um, Diane is asking if you can give an example of uh, the moon um, by house placement and sign placement. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're having a very long talk and I'm getting a bit tired so I'm uh, I'm no I'm there's not there's nothing comes it's, to mind especially so right maybe uh maybe it's a bit broad for um mm -hmm. this moment yeah. in the talk and actually now that you mentioned it, we are coming upon um two and a half hours so I just want mm -hmm. to make sure that I can uh show everybody once again where the replay will be yes and uh direct them to, um, to your website and YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, so once again, uh, if you go to nightlightastrology.com events and speaker series, um, starting tomorrow, the replay will be uh, here instead of the register here button, there will be a replay link. Uh, and then tomorrow, uh, please tune in for Kat Nelligan's talk on discovering the personal diamond. You can get your um, registration here link here if you haven't registered already. And uh, you can find Martine's uh, website here 
um, also. It is in Dutch, right, Martin? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm working on an English version. <laughs> it's working on it, but uh, he did include his email address um, in the slides. Yes. And then mm -hmm. also be sure to look him up on uh, YouTube um, as Martin Hermes. He has some good talks, you know, uh, zodiacal releasing and... Um, and some music. <laughs> And some music, et cetera, that you're going to want to check out. Uh, so, um, so I want to thank everybody uh, in attendance. Thank you for joining us. Uh, mm. Thank you, Martin, for giving such a wonderful talk. Uh, I got a message from Achuda. He said that he is sorry that he couldn't be here today, but he's very much looking forward to watching the recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Big I know. fan of you. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and I guess that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Delia, for your kind uh, attendance. Thank you. All right, take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.